phase space saturates. And then you have this uh, just slow decline in the cross section going roughly like uh, 1 over s um, or logarithmic corrections, depending on some combination of 1 over the Higgs mass or 1 over s. Um, at high energy, it goes down like 1 over s, but there's logarithmic corrections as well that you can see. Um, anyway, so they're the designing these machines to be sort of near the maximum, but you kind of want to take it as low as possible because it gets very expensive to run it at higher energy. So sort of optimum choose to be around 240. You know, we're, we're not actually building any of these things yet, so they could build it anywhere here depending on other reasons. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering in this plot, what about two Higgs production? Um, yeah, so it depends on what you want to do. So if you want two Higgs, you would go to higher energy, but you would need at least um, uh, 250, but then you guess you want some phase space for it, so you go higher than that. Um, so two Higgs production is useful for probing triple Higgs couplings. Um, but then again, if you want to probe triple Higgs couplings, you can't just do E plus or minus two Higgs to two Higgs, right? So you have to do Z Higgs or something like that, so you actually want it to be higher above 300. So it's hard to directly probe triple Higgs couplings um, um, at these energies, uh, but you could see I indirectly. Um, okay, I just leave that there. No, it's from the phase space. So I I think about it. If, if if we insist that they be on shell, the Z and the Higgs, right? That means the cross section has to go to zero at 215, and it should be a smooth function. So if it goes to 0 to 215 as a smooth function, it's going to look something like that. Just draw some curve that goes to 0 at 215 and draw a line. Right? And that's, what, that's what's going on here. And it grows rather steeply. But really what's going on is the phase space available for the decay. So if it's exactly on shell, the Higgs and Z are at rest, and, and then everything goes back to back. But once you get above that, then they start having some energy. And there's a lot more possibilities when it has some energy than if it's just at rest. And so that extra phase space from where you can produce the Higgs and Z uh, instead of just one point where they're at rest, you start to get a bigger area of momentum that you can do, and that, that's what's going on. That's the, what we call the phase space effect. Um, and this is typical. I mean, every, every, you know, any on-shell production will look like this, where you have a turn on, and then it basically saturates, and you have a slow decay of energy. But this is an important one. Um, OK, so uh, what I want to do today is talk about the different particles that we have in the standard model. Uh, which I've drawn here in this nice circle that I like. Um, so so uh, Yuval is going to tell you all about the standard model itself and Lagrangian and, and gauge invariance and um, spontaneous symmetry breaking and fun things like that. I'm not going to write down Lagrangians. Um, I'm just going to tell you about what these particles look like in, in the real world. So how do you see them? Uh, what are they, you know, how do they interact? That there's a, the sort of mathematics of how you write it down and then the physics of what's actually relevant and how they decay and how they show up at colliders. Um, so this is going to be sort of complementary to what Yuval is doing. Um, and we're just going to go around uh, sort of from the inside out, um, although I'll save Higgs to the end. And um, so the particles of the standard model, I like this picture because the Higgs is sort of the centerpiece. We know it's related to the uh, mass generation mechanism uh, uh, for fundamental particles, but also it sort of it connects to everything um, uh, in an important way. So we have the Higgs here. The other fundamental particles are the gluon, the photon, the W and Z bosons. And then around the edge, we have the uh, various fermions. The up uh, uh, charm and top are the up-type uh, quarks, which all have charge plus 2 thirds. And then the down-type quarks are downstrange and bottom, which have uh, electric charge of minus a third. We have the neutrinos and the leptons. So we kind of separate into charge on the outside. Um, I guess W has charge plus 1. This has charge 0, which is why we put W and Z. Photonic glue would also have no electric charge. Um, so we'll start with the W boson. Um, so uh, the, the double W boson couples to all of the uh, uh, fermions. So what can the W decay to? It's the first thing we're going to talk about. Uh, well, okay, let's do the let's do the mass first. What's the mass of the W boson? Eighty GeV. Maybe we'll put, maybe we should do the masses first. So 80, what's the mass of the Z? 90, all right, 92. We're going to say 90. Mass of the gluon? Mass of the photon? Um, where should we start? Mass of the neutrinos? Zero from, our, from the collider point of view, it's zero. Um, Andrea and Yuval might have different opinions. But uh, from collider physics, we treat them as zero. Um, not that you're sensitive to their mass anyway. Um, Mass of the bottom, four, roughly four. Strange, 
These are all in GEV. Anyone know the mass of the strange quark? 100 MeV, good. Uh, down quark? What? 4.7 what? MeV? Let's say 4 MeV? Close enough. So this is sort of scheme dependent. Um, up? 2.2, again, that's very precise for something that's not that precisely defined. But let's just say, we can say 2 MeV. From the collider point of view, we'll treat that as zero. Uh, charm? 95? 95 what? One GV, maybe like 1.2 GV. Uh, top? 170 what? Three? Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, tau? Yeah, like roughly 1.7. Muon? 100 MeV. I don't expect you all to know this. Electron, you should all know because you see it on license plates apparently. 511 five, KeV. Okay. Um, so we're gonna start talking about these particles and understanding them. Uh, a lot of these masses aren't, uh, aren't so well defined and you have to be a little bit more careful about what we mean by the mass and we'll get to that. Um, the W is not ambiguous. Uh, 80 GeV, um, again, I'm sorry about my voice. It's, uh, I don't know why, I've, I've, I'm, I'm struggling with it. Okay, so what can the W decay to? So give me an example, lepton neutrino, which lepton? Electron and neutrino, it can decay to, what else, muon, neutrino, it can decay to tau and neutrino. What else can it decay to? What? Up and down, good. Charm and strange, bottom and top. Anything else? What? Up and strange. All right, let's, let's try to draw this more systematically. So, uh, let, me, let me move these. Um, so, we have up, down bar, up, strange bar, up, bottom bar, uh, charm, down bar, charm, strange bar, charm, bottom bar, Top, down, top, S bar, and top, bottom bar. Uh, so the couplings of W to these various things are determined by the, the various CK elements. So this would be VUD, which is approximately one. This is proportional to VUS, um, which is 0 0.2. This is VUB, which is 0 0.04. Am I, can people read this? Am I writing too small? All right, I'll try to, maybe who cares if they can read it. Uh, VCD, 0 0.2, VCS is approximately one, VCB is approximately 0 0.004, VTB, approximately one, VTS, 0 0.04, and VTD is 0 0.008. Um, so what you see from the structure is the diagonal elements, which go to the, the uh, quarks of the same generation, are approximately one. So to a leading approximation, the W decays diagonally, but there's some non-negligent component where the W can, can uh, decay in a uh, mixed generation, where it decays with second generation or first generation, uh, and it's very hard for it to decay to a third generation or first generation. So we say these are sort of Kabibo suppressed, and these are Kabibo squared, uh, but they're off diagonal elements the farther from the diagonal. So there's this weird structure to this AKM matrix that we don't really understand. Why should it be close to diagonal? It's just an accident in nature. Um, and maybe someone will figure that out one day. But for now, this is the, these are the couplings of the W bosons that we observe experimentally. Um, okay, so now let's ask, what is the, uh, so first of all, which one of these can the W not decay to? So these are all its couplings. Right. So, Tops, right? The top is 175 and the W is 80. So none of these it can decay to. 
OK, so that being said, what is the branching ratio of the W? So we're going to treat everything else as massless. What is the branching ratio of W, say, to electron and neutrino? Right? So you can look it up, but let's calculate it. Um, right? So the nice thing about the W interactions, they're determined by uh, SU2, and they're the same for all these couplings. And here we tell you the strength of the interactions, and we're taking these to be um, approximately 1. And we can take these to be approximately 0. It doesn't really matter, because the sum over all of them is determined by unitarity to be the same as the sum to the diagonal components. Um, so can anyone give me an estimate for what this is? How much of the time, how many Ws do you need to get one electron? Yeah. What? Say it again. 20 percent. 20 So where'd you get 20 percent? What, what did you do? Five equals channels. One, two, three, four, five. So we're setting this as approximately zero, this is approximately zero. Um, that's not quite right, but that's close. What is he forgetting? Color. Great. So color means, so you all told you that the quarks have color as representations of SU3. From the collider physics point of view, I think it's easier to think of color as like red, green, and blue, right? So that color is really a charge, like electric charge. So instead of electric charge being a, um, a number, we have discrete indices, but there's three colors of quarks. And so the easiest way to do the counting is you say, there's, this can happen, and this is red. Since color is conserved, this has to be anti-red. Um, in the same way, if this charm is blue, this has to be anti-blue. Um, nevertheless, I could, I could have a red anti-red, green anti-green, or blue anti-green. So there's three possible decays to three different colors of um, quarks. Now, the way we do the calculation, we do some traces and sums and so on, and it's fancier mathematics. But you get the same answer as if you just count the number of colors, especially when you do inclusive decays. This is a much more easy way to do it. Uh, yeah? Sorry, I think that argument what argument is too quick? Hmm? Right. No, so for quarks, it's fine, right? Because it's red, it's, it's a, a three and a three bar, right? right? So we have the triplet and the anti triplet. So th th there's, no, there's no approximation here. This is exact, right? You're producing, th there's three possible final states. So we don't normally measure the, the, the color of it, and we know color is conserved. But you could, in principle, measure the color of a quark if they were asymptotically free particles, which they're not, right? I mean, if, if you could see a quark, it would have a color, much like isospin. So think of it like SU2. SU2, we can have a neutron and a proton, right? So if the point of SU2, one is isospin a half, one is isospin minus a half. Something that decays to neutrons and protons, it can make a neutron, neutron bar, proton, proton bar. I can just figure out what it was. Was it a neutron or a proton? And then I have one of those and one of those, and I just count. And that summing of two types of isospin is the same as the summing of three colors here. Well, I'm saying it doesn't have to be, right? It only has to be when you're, when you're at large distances and things hadronize and you end up being color singlishes. Yeah, well, eventually, so these aren't stable particles, right? But I'm using the sort of approximation where I produce the quarks, and then something happens to them, right? So in the approximation, I don't, I'm just doing perturbation theory, and I don't care if they turn into color singlet hadrons, right? So from a perturbation theory point of view, I can just produce red and anti-red quarks, and I can pretend I can measure that, and I don't have to sum over, uh, uh, I don't have to treat them as color singlet objects. Right? And if this is a, a, a useful, I mean, it's a useful tool to really think of them as having separate colors, like we think of particles having a separate isospin. Right, in the same way, I can say, well, I could have SU3 invariants that I don't have to worry about up and down. Um, but, it, but it's helpful to separate out the up and down channels. Yeah? No, again, color. These here? No, 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 but, but, the, but because this isn't quite one. Right? And so when you sum everything, when you sum the squares of the elements, the CK matrix, when you sum the squares of everything that WK do, it sums to one anyway. Right? And so, but, but, but anyway, there's three here, so you get the same suppression. This is down by a factor, this is 4% of this, right? whether or not you sum over colors. Because the color, you have three of these and three of these. So it's still down by 4%. So I don't care. But, yeah. 
but so either way it works out. Anyway, so we have uh, three colors of this and three colors of this. So we have six over here plus three altogether here, right? So we have nine total instead of five. So the answer here is one over nine, right, which is around 10%. Right? So basically you get 10% uh, here, 10% here, 10% here, <coughs> and then you have, both will be the 30, so we have 70 left over, so we get, uh, I guess I did an approximation here, 35 and 35, roughly like that. Um, so what we say, um, where's my W? So if we draw uh, a pie chart for the W branching ratio, uh, so we say, what do these look like? So if the W decays to up or down quarks, they become these jets that I talked about last time. Uh, so we have basically 70% of the time it decays to jets, and 30% of the time it decays to leptons. Uh, so we can draw it as a, as a sort of pie chart. 70% jets. Um, and then of the leptons, we say it's 10% um, electrons, 10% muons. Um, and then there's taus, which are another 10%. So these are useful numbers to know, right? Because leptons are much easier to see than uh, jets. So if you see an electron or muon, mostly those are the decays you want of the W. So if you're interested in leptonic W decays, we'll talk about taus in a minute, um, but they don't decay leptonically and they're much harder to identify. So these things are easier to identify. Remember I showed you those like Z boson plots or the the, the transverse mass distribution for the W, and they always involve the leptonic channels, not the jet. Um, so basically, when you have a W, you get a clean measurement of the W. I mean, you get neutrinos in this process, but you get a clean trigger, at least, that there was a W 20% of the time. So that's a useful number. The 20% of the Ws are sort of useful and clean, um, in a sense. And that'll come in, 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 into other processes, too. Are there questions about this, how we did the estimate? Okay, so now let's do the Z boson. Do the same thing. Uh, the Z is neutral. We know its mass is 90 GV. We wrote that over there. Um, so the Z can decay. Since it's neutral, it decays to things like BB bar, can't decay to TT bar, CC bar, SS bar, UU bar, and DD bar. It can decay to leptons. Um, mu, mu, tau, tau, and neutrinos. So there, there's three neutrinos. Let me write them out as their separate particles. Okay, so what's the branching ratio of Z to electrons? You guys think about it for a second. I heard a 1 over 21. You have 30%. 33% of the time goes to electrons. So those are very different answers. You want everything else? Okay, so how do we do it? Well, we do the same argument we did before. So there's, um, these are the hadronic channels. So uh, we multiply them by 3. So we get 5 times 3 is 15 of these, and there's 6 of these. So we have 21 total, so then we get this 1 out of 21 um, percent of the time, which is maybe 4%. Um, there's one catch with the Z, that it's a case differently to um, the uptight part of the SE2 doublet or the downtight part of the SE2 doublet. So the Z couplings um, are proportional to uh, T3 minus uh, Q times sine theta. So depending on the electric charge of the isospin. Uh, but anyway, this is some number of order one. Uh, so this is plus or minus a half, and then it depends on the charge. So you get slightly different couplings um, to different things, but the numbers are about right. So this is, so it turns out this is closer to uh, 3%, 3% here, 3% here, 3% here. Um, it ends up being taking neutrinos a little bit more, so 6% for these guys. Um, and in the same way, you get a slightly larger percentage for the Bs um, and 11% uh, for 
Um, you get 11% for the uptype quarks and 15% for the downtype quarks. So if we draw the pie chart, um, we get, uh, so if you add up all the jet decay modes, you get around 77% jets. Um, but you only get a little bit, so you get 3% um, electron, 3% muon, um, and 18% neutrinos. Right? So, so what this means is that the Z, these kind of golden decay modes for the Z, you only get 6% of the time, while for the W, you have 20% of the time. Right? So this is a problem. You pay a huge penalty for asking for Zs. These are very clean because you see everything. So W is you get neutrinos and they're missing energy and you can't completely reconstruct the, the um, W. Zs are fantastic because you always know if you have a Z when it decays leptonically, but you only get leptonic Z decays 6% um, of the time. Um, so that's a trade-off you pay. Uh, and so there's been a lot of work to understand these hadronic modes because they play such an important role. Um, and I think a lot of developments in collider physics over the 10 years have helped increase the amount of Ws and Zs that we consider useful from, from including the hadronic decay mode. Uh, questions? So, so on, another question from the, the, the problems yesterday was what happens if there's another neutrino? How would it affect um, the Z width? Right? So to answer that, you just add another one here. Right? So if you have another neutrino, then instead of 21, you would have 22. Right, uh, mode. So a rough approximation, you would get you know maybe one percent difference um, in the branch cache each mode, and one percent difference in the uh, um, in in the width. So you have to know: do we measure the z width to within one percent? And the answer is yes. And then you can put a bound based on on knowing that and how many neutrinos we have. So if we had covered this yesterday, you would have been able to solve that problem. Okay, let's keep moving. Uh, we have a lot more particles to do. Next, we'll talk about the top. Um, the top is a very interesting particle because it's so heavy. Uh, uh, because it's so heavy, it couples very strongly to the Higgs boson, and that actually makes it very useful for, for Higgs physics, um, among other things. It's also related to the stability of our universe. Uh, so the third particle we're talking about is the top. OK. Um, we talked about, someone said its mass was 173. Let me say 175 GV. Um, does anyone know what mass that is? When we talk about this mass, what, what do we mean by mass? Can you go put a top on a scale and weigh it? That's not what we mean, right? So this is a particular type of mass called the pole mass, right? Here's another mass, 5 GV, right? That's also the top quark mass. Right? I'm just defining, here's a mass, I'm defining it to be 5 GV. This is the Schwartz mass scheme in which I've defined the top to be 5 GV. Right? Um, you can pick a mass scheme and make it a TeV. You can do whatever you want. Right? There's no physics in associated with this scheme. So when we tell you what the, the, the mass is, we have to be more careful about uh, what we mean. And it's particularly important in the, to in the top quark. So the top quark, nobody uses the Schwartz mass scheme. Um, instead, let me call this M pole. Um, the, the most common are the pole mass. Um, and the MS bar mass, which is 163 GV, MS bar mass, right? So the pole mass is more closely m related to what you would measure in a collider. If you try to produce tops and look at the invariant mass of the decay products, the thing you'll be extracting is close to the pole mass. Not exactly, but if you understand how to do the calculations, you can relate the two. Um, but the thing that's used in precision calculations, like in the calculation of the stability of the universe, uh, you would use the MS bar mass. You can convert between these two perturbatively, so the difference between them is proportional to any one of them times something like 1 plus alpha over pi times some number, I don't know, 6, whatever it is. So there's some perturbative correction that you could do to relate the two, but, but you see they differ by 10 GeV, right? So is 10 GeV a lot? I don't know, it's 5% of the difference, right? But this is a, a, a typical difference, and the reason it's large is because, first of all, the top is colored, so you get a factor of Ca, which is 3 um, in this correction, and that's fairly large. Well, for the W boson and the Z boson, they don't interact strongly, and so there is a difference between the pole mass and the MS bar mass, but it's very, very small. It's less than 1%. Um, so the top quark, because it's so big, you notice the difference, 
Um, and it's just important to keep in mind when people talk about the top quark mass, you always have to know what mass they're talking about. And as we're getting towards precision measurements of the top mass, the, the, this has become an interesting issue theoretically, because it's not clear when the experiments measure the mass exactly what scheme they're doing the measurement, partly because they're just doing fits to Pythia, um, and Pythia doesn't have a well-defined short distance mass scheme. So it's not clear that the ambiguities in the simulations they use are accurate enough to distinguish different mass schemes. Um, so there's some, some controversy. I wouldn't say controversy. There's some development that's required to get beyond the, you know, if you want to get 1% on the top mass, you have to know the difference between the different schemes. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, how does the top decay? The top almost always erased the CKM elements, uh, but it almost always decays through a W boson. Uh, so the top goes to B and a W boson. Um, and that's because the VTB, all the other couplings were very, very small for the top. So from a collider physics point of view, 100% of the time it decays to a B and a W, and the W is on shell um, because it's lighter than the top. And then the W decays to whatever it decayed to before, which we had here. W decays, right? Um, so typically, tops are produced in pairs. So, the dominant production mechanism of the LHC is gluons come in and interact with tops. So this is gluon top pair production. Um, uh, the cross section is pretty large, the pico barn range uh, for, for TT bar production, especially uh, at high energy where the top mass becomes negligible. Um, so you produce tops in pairs, and then you want to identify them. So most of the time, they decay to jets. And if the tops are decaying to jets, it's very hard to see them because there's a lot of jets that don't come from tops, right? So if it's just the top, so one thing you could have is a top, uh, you know, so it decays to a B and then a W, and say that decayed to UD bar, then you would get three jets over there and three jets on the other side, and you can B-tag it to help, but you also have just glue glue to six gluons. Um, and that's an enormous cross-section. That's a million times bigger. So it's very hard to see, um, or more than a million times bigger, uh, these fully hydronic modes. Um, so usually what you do is you say, let me have one of the Ws decay to jets, and one of them uh, decay to leptons. So you might have something like electron neutrino. Uh, and, and then what you do is you use the electron. So this is a hard electron, because you're finding the W from the electron. So you look for events with one hard electron, um, uh, and two B jets, and then some other jets, and that is the largest cross section. Uh, so we, we divide the top decays into uh, three regions. There's um, fully hydronic, there's semi leptonic, and then there's fully leptonic. Uh, so, what are the so what fraction of events are fully hedronic, where both Ws decay to jets? I guess let's start on the other side. What fraction is fully leptonic, where both, both Ws decay to electrons or muons? Right, so for one W to decay to electrons or muons is 20%. So for two Ws, you have to square it. So you get 20% squared, which is 0.04, so 4%. So this is 4% of the time you get two leptons, right? So the fully leptonic channel, you just, you, you, you're losing almost all of your tops if you demand it. Also, when you have two Ws decay leptonically, you have two neutrinos. And with one neutrino, you can, you can reconstruct the W if you put it on shell. So before we talked about measuring the W mass uh, from MT and so on, but if you know the W mass, then you have an extra constraint that you can use to determine the neutrino momentum completely. Um, so with when one W decays to a neutrino, that's okay. It doesn't really hurt you. But when you have two Ws, then you have missing energy as the sum of the two neutrino momenta, and you can't do anything with it. So the fully leptonic channel is not so useful, but it's very clean because you just have two B jets and two muons. Um, Semi-leptonic channel, what's the branching ratio? 14 percent? 2%? 8%? 30%? 30 So one decays 20 percent, then we have the other one decay 20 percent, so we get 14 percent, where's 14 percent? Uh, 
Yeah, but there's also, right, so it's really 80 because we're not including the tau's. So we want one to k to this and one to k to something else, right? So it's basically, it, 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 it's, 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 20% for one jet and then 20% for the other jet. So we just have to add them as opposed to multiplying them. So we get uh, 40%. So 40% way of one of them decay and the other one does not decay. So we don't care because we're using the lepton to tag the top. Uh, we don't care if it decays the tiles or not. So we get 40% and then this is the remaining 56% um, is fully hadronic. So this is the messiest channel with the largest background. This semi-leptonic channel is the channel that almost all top physics studies are done. Uh, because the top channel, the, the semi-leptonic channel is very nice because you use the leptonic side to tag that it was a TT bar event. Almost all tops come from TT bar events. Um, and then you have this other side where you can reconstruct the top. So if you want to measure the top mass, what you do is you tag that it's a TT bar event using this side, but then you use these three jets to figure out what the top mass is. Right? You don't need to worry about the neutrino because we're not using this side of the decay at all to reconstruct the top. So it's convenient that we have two tops at the same time and that makes it very easy to measure properties of the top. So we have a huge sample of these semi-leptonic top jets and they're useful for studying you know, color connections between these jets for the decays and understanding properties of the W boson. It's also actually the best sample of W, hydronically decaying W bosons. So if you're interested in Ws for some reason that decay hydronically, you look at the TT bar channel. Because if you just look for a single W that decayed hydronically, that would just be a digen event and that's a mess. So TT bar is a huge sample of tops and Ws that can be studied for precision or for beyond the standard model searches or things like that. It's a question. Yeah. Well, it, it's, this, it's the same. You just have to do one minus it because it's the, you want one to, be, uh, one to be leptonic and one not to be leptonic, and then the other one can be leptonic. So you end up just saying 20% one's leptonic and the other is 20%. Uh, I mean, just count the, you, 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 you'll see it's right. It just takes a little thinking. Yeah. Did I do the numbers wrong? What? You mean you're talking about taus? Yeah, let me, let me include taus in this. So let me call this 80. The taus are basically hadronic. So, no, it's 1 minus 80. What, you, 80, 80 minus 64, yeah. So, Emily Leptonic includes. Let, 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 let's talk about this later. Um, these are the, 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 the standard numbers. Um, uh, okay, there's, there's more exotic top decays, but let me, let me skip those. Um, what are we doing on time? Let me, let me I'll wait for the time to come about again. Uh, we have an hour. Um, yeah, okay, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, top mass measurements, because uh, that's, as I said, Understanding the top precisely is one of the goals of, of precision physics, and we don't actually know it that well. Um, it's one of the least well-known quarks, despite the fact that it's heavy, and so heavy means that we should get a better precision measurement of it, because it's not sensitive to hadronization effects and things like that. Um, the goal, what we'd like to get is around uh, 100 MeV uncertainty or something like that on the top quark mass. This is what we need to determine vacuum stability and so on. Right now, the uncertainty is around 1 GeV. Um, but again, there's the, even the uncertainty is uh, debatable because of issues like what mass scheme is it measuring. Uh, so there's the systematic uncertainty from the experiment, and then there's the theoretical uncertainty. And theoretical uncertainty is notoriously hard to assess because it's not statistical. It's more about what you don't know and how do you assess what you don't know. Um, uh, but let me just kind of summarize how do you measure the top mass. Um, So uh, the most obvious way to measure the top mass is kinematic. Um, and, and so here we can do uh, um, dilepton um, semi-leptonic and hadronic. Um, so these have different advantages. The dilepton, the fully leptonic channel, uh, has a very small branching ratio, 
uh, it's relatively clean, but you can't reconstruct the tops completely, right? Because you have two neutrinos. So it's not a very useful channel. Um, um, it has, you know, it has good signal over background. There's basically no background for that. It's B jets plus missing energy. Um, but they do the analysis anyway, so you have to do something like MT, the transverse mass, and try to extract the top from the transverse mass um, of the leptons. Uh, there's, there's some other related observables they use, but you get around a delta MT of 1.6 uh, G uh, from the dilepton. The semileptonic channel, as I mentioned, is uh, the best way to do it, so um, this also has good signal over background and you fully reconstruct it. So fully reconstruct, because you have the hadronic side, you have everything the top decayed to, and you can just look at the invariant mass of it, right? So you just look for a peak, and you fit this to a bright Wigner distribution, and you extract the top quark pole mass from this, and then you get a delta MT of around um, 0 0.5 GeV. And it's this half a GeV that's, that's controversial. So, this is sort of the experimental uncertainty on it, but then it's not clear, as I said, the difference between pole mass and MS bar mass is 10 GeV. Uh, so subleading order differences between the two are, you know, hundreds of MeV, which is the same order of this. There's some controversy that the pole mass itself isn't well defined. There's what's called a Renormalon ambiguity, and there's estimates of how big that would be, and it's, you know, again, in the few hundred MeV range. So it's not clear whether we can trust these results, but um, nevertheless, this is the, the cleanest channel experimentally. Um, the hadronic channel has a huge background, um, uh, and you get delta MT is around 1.5 GeV. So a lot of way to get around this huge background is to ask for the tops to have extra energy, so they're called boosted, and then you can identify, you reduce the backgrounds by asking for boosted tops. So one of the results of a lot of this jet substructure developments um, in the last 10 years has been to use the fully hadronic channel um, to do interesting physics. Um, and you get, you know, the advantage of having more events. Anyway, the, the, the bottom line is the semi-leptonic decay where you look for the invariant mass of the top is the best channel in the kinematic range. Um, yeah. No, so the, in, in the leptonic channel? In the dilept, so the dilepton you have, right, so you might have B, mu, and neutrino, right? So you get a two B jets and electron and neutrino. So if I just took the mu on in a B jet, I wouldn't reconstruct the top because I don't have this neutrino. In the same way here, so I have two neutrinos, so you can't do it. You have to do something like with the top where you look for transverse mass and you look for an endpoint, right? So it's the same thing here where they'll have an endpoint of the transverse mass at twice the top mass. Um, however, you generally fit the shape. So what you do is you calculate this in Monte Carlo and you fit the shape and you vary the top mass. So there's still Monte Carlo. Here you can do it a little bit more analytically. Um, but it's still a fit to a shape. So you have the same sort of ambiguities of what scheme you're interested in. Um, it's the uncertainty on the top quark mass. Right, so there's a plus or minus here, right? Uh, let's write that. I think I have it. Do I have it? Well, I don't know what it is exactly, but it's around the GEV. So when you read these numbers, you'll see 175 plus or minus 1 GeV. Right, and it's this, it's this plus or minus that I'm talking about. Right. Anyway, so that's the goal of the LHC is to improve this. The prospects are, well, probably we're not going to do better than this. This is sort of the experimental limit, but, but now there's theoretical considerations, which is an interesting topic um, on its own right. Okay, uh, kinematic. Uh, Ah, good. Next, total cross section. Um, so the total cross section is an interesting measurement because there you can compare directly to a theoretical calculation. I just count the number of tops I have. If I know the luminosity of the machine, I can extract the cross section, right? And this is something that's been computed to three loops, I think, right? So this is a precision calculation and it's a precision measurement. And the advantage of this is you know what scheme you're in, so you don't have to do these shape fits and you can do the calculation of the total cross-section in MS bar, right? So we know sigma total has a function of M top MS bar, 
two, three loops. So that we have a very good theoretical handle on this. The thing that we don't have a very good theoretical handle is the partner distribution functions. So the dominant uncertainty here is determined by uncertainties on what the PDFs are, and that, that, that limits the utility of this. Um, also, you need to calculate, you need to count the number of tops uh, very accurately. So you can, of course, count in the semi-leptonic channel and just multiply by the branching ratio. Um, which is mostly what they do, because the hadronic one you can't really count. Nevertheless, there's experimental uncertainties on backgrounds and so on, so um, there's, there's issues involved in that. Uh, the bottom line is you get a delta MT from this currently at around 1.5 GeV. Um, the hope is by the end of the LHC to get that down below a GeV, and the advantage there really is that you're directly measuring the MS bar mass for the top, um, so that's a promising channel. Uh. <coughs> The third way of measuring the top is through what's called a threshold scan. At E plus E minus. So this is something you can't do at the LHC, but you could do at an E plus E minus machine. So the idea there is you change the center of mass energy, and you look at the cross section as a function of the center of mass energy. Well, it's just S. I'm at a hadron collider. And what you imagine, so, so you're looking for E plus E minus to TT bar right, through an intermediate photon, so. Um, so it's gonna turn on in the same way as I showed up there at around 350, right? And then it goes up and goes down. Um, so if you know the location of where it turns on, you can measure this precisely. But what's really neat about the top is that there's actually a bound state. Um, it's a very unstable bound state, but you can have gluons exchanged between the top and so you can form this metastable bound state slightly below the TT bar mass. So if this is 350, what you'll see is there's actually a little blip here, um, and there's a, a, a resonance from a TT bar bound state slightly below the pole. So if you can measure this shape very well, there's ways to know exactly what the mass of this bound state is, and that's very sensitive to the top quark mass. So um, if we can build an E plus E minus collider and run it near 350, which again is 100 GeV higher than what I was talking about in this plot, right? And again, it's very, very expensive. It goes like the fourth power of the energy to build one of these things, um, then we have the potential of measuring delta MT less than, I don't know, 100 MeV, right? So this is one of the strongest reasons to build an E plus E minus collider and to run it at high energy so that we can finally determine what the top quark is in an unambiguous scheme. So again, these are theory calculations about the location of the pole where actually you don't use MS bar or pole mass, you use something called the 1S scheme, which is some non-relativistic QCD scheme that's also has the nice properties of being normal on free and, and stuff like that. Uh, let me not get into that. The bottom line is that this, this goal is probably only achievable at an E plus E minus collider. And in a hadron collider, you, the, the, this is, might be the experimental, the systematics limit. Let me write systematics. Um, but it might be true that MT theory um, you know, is 1 GeV. So depending on who you talk to, people will say there's an irreducible 1 GeV uncertainty from uh, shape measurements from pole mass extractions at the LHC. Um, some people will say you can get down. I personally think that we'll be able to get it down. I think this is a reasonable goal for the LHC, about half a GeV, which may or may not, depending on the value, uh, be good enough to exclude the stability of the universe. But we'll, we'll, we'll have to see where that goes. Uh, questions about top? Yeah, it's only 10 to the minus 28 seconds. Right, well, the, the, so, so, yeah, great question. So the question is, um, the, top, the top is so short-lived, how could it form a bound state? So what you're seeing is the, the effects of these virtual corrections on the, the existence of center of mass energy. So it's not like you actually propagate anywhere, right? And there's a competition between the decay of the bound state and the weak decay. Um, and they have the same lifetime. But those lifetimes, it's okay. From the point of view of the top decaying, you know, it, 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 it can form a bound state. You, you can see evidence of this binding um, before it decays, and that's what shows up in this plot. Um, so it, in, right, in, a, in a sense, you can think of this as I'm just calculating the TT bar cross section with extra gluons in it. And if I sum this whole series of ladder diagrams, what it does is it, it decreases the cross section and then increases it at lower energy. So it allows for, um, even if these decay, if I include the whole decay chain, right, you'll see some of these effect in the, in the production cross-section because of this binding effect. So it sort of factorizes off from the actual decay. That's a great question. These are, these are, there's, 
beautiful physics associated with doing these calculations, but it's a well-established, maybe I shouldn't write so low over there, um, a, a field. So what is calculations in our QCD? Yeah. I, I, you know, may, why is it so hard? We don't know anything to three loops. Yeah, well, the beta function is a two-point function, right? You just calculate the, glue, the correct shifts of the glue propagator. The TT bar is protons come in, and you need all these different channels, and tops come out, and you need extra jets, and you have to do inclusive cross-sections, so you have to sum over the phase space. It's very, very difficult. Um, it, it, I mean, it's sort of a heroic effort to know it at NNLO, um, which, which is only achieved rather recently. But I don't think, the, again, the precision on the theory is good enough that we don't need to go to four loops. It's also an asymptotic series, so if you get on three loops, it starts not converging, and it's not helpful to go to, go to higher order. But it's really dominated by um, PDF uncertainties and other things like that. Um, interesting theory question, but, but doing inclusive calculations ends up being very difficult uh, uh, at high order. A lot of that to do with just removing the infrared divergences from the phase space integrals in the loop, which is not something you can do analytically. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I was saying. So it depends on the value of the top quark mass. So right now, vacuum, so the, the thing that we might be able to establish is whether the universe is absolutely stable or its lifetime is finite, right? It's, it, it, we've excluded the possibility of the universe's lifetime being less than 15 billion years, right, which would be the most interesting case. So that's already excluded to like 100 sigma um, for precision measurements. But if we measure the top quark mass, so it's about two sigma, the stability boundary between absolute stability and metastability. We're about two sigma away, but it's, a, it's, non, it's nonlinear. So you, you can't really quantify it. So the top quark mass comes out slightly lower. So the way it works, um, I mean, this is interesting physics. I don't know if it's going to be covered somewhere else. Uh, this is a real aside from what we're talking about. Um, right, so you guys have all seen this Higgs potential that looks like that. Um, so this is just V of, uh, v of H is minus M squared H squared plus lambda H to the fourth. Um, uh, because quantum field theories are normalizable, you can calculate radiative corrections to this, and you can trust the calculations all the way up to M Planck. Uh, so we can figure out what this potential is, and so you get these terms that look h fourth log of h over some, some scale. Let me write v um, um, for the VEV. And uh, so the coefficient here depends on what's going into the loop. So what you do is you calculate corrections to the Higgs potential. So the leading order thing is lambda, it looks like that. Um, but I could have something with, say, a top loop going around. Um, or I can have something, so this might be a top, or I can have Higgses going around. H, um, and they, they go in different ways. So a Higgs is a scalar, it's a boson, so it has a positive contribution. So the, the, basically, the lambda is inversely proportional to the Higgs mass if I fix the VEV. So if I um, increase the Higgs mass, the potential becomes more stable. So, so the question is, does it go over here like this? Does it come down? Does it go up? Um, and you'd like to know if it goes below zero or it never goes below zero. So if it goes below zero, then you can tunnel from our vacuum to this, and that's the instability. Um, and so the bigger the top mass is, because this is a fermion, the more of a negative contribution you have. So a higher top mass makes the universe less stable. Um, but we know what the top mass is, and you need to know what it is in the right scheme in order to be able to do these calculations. Uh, and it turns out it's sort of marginal. So if the top mass were, I don't know, a GeV heavier than we think it is, then the universe would be unstable. Right? So you need to know the top uncertainty to be small enough so that it has to be a GV heavier than what it is, and the uncertainty has to be small enough so that you can say with confidence um, that, you're, that, that it's unstable. So you know, it depends on the value of what the top mass comes out to be, but, but if, it, if, you, if some result says the top mass is half a GV heavier, you should say that's very interesting. Right? If it turns out to be lower, it doesn't matter. Right? If, if we resolve it by another 5 GV and it ends up being lower, then we're done. The universe is metastable. So that's sort of the open question. Nobody really knows why, why it's interesting. I mean, 
there's sort of uh, cosmological reasons to ask, you know, does the existence of a lower energy vacuum, right, there's, there, you know, sort of we're in de Sitter space, and this would be an anti de Sitter vacuum, and there's questions about whether de Sitter vacuum even exists, right? So there's this weak gravity conjecture that says that this kind of state can't exist. Um, there's, there's sort of interesting theoretical reasons to, to care about this, um, besides the fact of knowing what the fate of the universe is going to be, which I think is sort of philosophically interesting, but there's sort of mathematical physics elements to trying to resolve this question. Um, whether it's worth spending a hundred billion dollars to build a machine, I don't know. Um, but it seems like a question that we can answer in our lifetime, so maybe we should. But I'm not holding the purse strings, you know. A, a question? Yeah, so this is the zero temperature potential. So thermal, the thermal effects you take into account to figure out how we got here in the first place, right? So you might want to ask, as the universe cooled, did we end up in this vacuum or down here, whether or not it's heavier or lower than ours? And that's a totally separate question. We're assuming we're here because we see ourselves to be here. And then we just want to know if we're going to end up there. And the universe is basically at zero temperature, t equals zero, from the point of view of now. So during the electric phase transition, there's other questions about the order of this transition. So at high temperature, this thing is stupid. It's just a parabola that goes like t squared. And as you lower it, you can ask, is there a first order or second order phase transition? And how do we end up in this vacuum? Um, and does inflation reheat past this plate, so you end up cooling there? And those are a whole separate other separate qu set of questions, which, I mean, you can just say, what I know experimentally is that we're here, and I can answer this question independent of how we got there. But if it turns out there's new physics that affects the potential at scale, so I should say the scale here is around 10 to the 17 GeV. Well, uh, 10 to the 17 is the relevant scale. The, the, this potential isn't really gauge invariant. Um, but, uh, uh, it, so if there's scales that, if, if, if you reheated too high, you'd end up, maybe we cooled into the other vacuum. That could have happened. So there's questions about early universe cosmology that might need to be resolved um, if you modify the physics at that scale. Um, but from the point of view of just our universe that we have now, assuming the standard model, it's a well-defined question. If we find physics beyond the standard model, you don't ask this question anymore because a lot of other things contribute to that potential. But all of this is predicated on just having the standard model and nothing else. Right, which, you know, we, we would love to see something else, but that's what we have. Um, you know, and again, it's weird to try to build a collider assuming it's the standard model because you want to answer a question, but also to say I want to look for things beyond the standard model. But in some sense, that's what we already did with the LHC, right? We built it to find the Higgs in the standard model, but we were hoping to find something else. So maybe we'll do it again. Questions? All right, we only got through three particles. We got another half hour. Um, in the middle ring. All right, um, let's do bottom next. MS bar mass for the bottom is 4.5 uh, GeV. Uh, so the bottom quark, unlike the top, hadronizes before it decays. Um, you know, the top quark lifetime, I guess I should write this. So the top quark of the top um, is 10 to the minus 23 seconds. Uh, um, the lifetime for the bottom is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So uh, the top is much, much more unstable than the bottom. Uh, I guess to compare these to other things, the lifetime uh, for the pion, the neutral pion is 10 to the minus 17 seconds. So this is because pi naught decays to photons, so the anomaly, so it ends up being um, very fast. And pi plus. 10 to the minus 8 seconds. So this is just relative scale. So the top is very, very unstable. The bottom um, is sort of metastable. The pi naught is very unstable. So the bottom, uh, uh, so what is the, how do we think about these scales more, um, more physically? So the, uh, so we talk about the decay length. 
uh, lambda is c tau. So if something is moving at the speed of light, we'd like to know how far it goes before it decays. Uh, so we multiply the lifetime by the speed, and we get uh, 450 to 500 um, microns, which is around half a millimeter. So the bottom core goes around half a millimeter before it decays, and that means we can see it because we can measure micron level um, uh, tracks and so on uh, in, in our tracker or some or tenth of a micron um, type resolution. Uh, so, so bottom quarks are nice because they hadronize and then they move and then they decay. And they're kind of special because this regime is basically the size of our tracker. So we can basically see the bottoms move and then we see their decay products. And that's how we use, the, that's the basic ingredient we use for identifying bottoms. Um, Um, so how does the bottom decay? So, so kind of formula. So the bottom decays to, say, a tau on, um, and the rates for these formulas have a, a, a go like G Fermi, and then they go like G, V U B squared times some other numbers. And it's this uh, V. It's the combination of V U B being small because it's a flavor change in decay. So remember, a bottom, a top is heavier than the bottom. So the bottom will decay through a W, but it doesn't have a top to connect to. So it has to connect to something else. So this, this B is a B U bar bound state. So you can think of the B going and decaying through a W to a tau and a neutrino. And then a U kind of comes along and forms another bound state uh, with, say, the D or BU, right? So uh, this would be a B meson uh, decaying to a pi naught and a T do, and then this pi naught decays to um, gamma gamma. Um, well, that says that. Um, right. So you so you have this. Um, uh, yeah, so th this kind of decay, you have this, this uh, VUB suppressed interaction, uh, which, which you need to have for all B decays. And that's sort of the origin of this lifetime of the top that involves this uh, Kabibo suppressed uh, off diagonal TKM element. Um, that's what I want to say about Bs. Let me. No. So. Uh, Typically, bees have cascade decays. So what that means is that the bee decays to something, which then decays to something else, which then decays to something else. So we might have a neutral bee decay to a D meson and a muon and a neutrino. And then this D decays to, say, a kaon and a pion by minus. And then the kaon decays to a pi plus by zero, and that decays to gamma gamma. So you have this is what we call a cascade decay. Um, the result is that you get a bunch of charged particles here. So we'd have one, two, three, four charged particles. Um, typical B decays have uh, uh, five or more charged particles. I don't know, maybe typical, let's say four or more, to be consistent with my example. Um, so they have a large number of charged particles coming from this cascade decay. So they typically will decay to a charm, and then the charm will decay, and then you get, you go down one, one flavor each time. Um, and that's sort of the origin of what's happening here. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, that's what happens here. The D is the charm meson. Yeah, it's still suppressed. Then this would be a D, and then that decays. No, it's still off diagonal, because remember, B is third generation, and charm is second generation. Um, so this one was even smaller than that. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah. so let me talk about uh, how do you find Bs. So the way Bs show up at a collider is they have this particle, you're produced from the hard interaction, it moves a little bit and decays, and then everything else basically decays promptly. So you see essentially one, one 
a vertex for the, de the, the decay that's separated from the hard vertex by something of order half a millimeter. Um, and then you see a bunch of tracks converging at that vertex from the charged particles. Uh, and, um, and then they decay into a bunch of particles. So, and typically, Bs will be accompanied by whatever else was produced. Right? So you might have a B produced from a gluon decaying to BB bar, which is not unusual. So you would have a gluon jet with two Bs in it. And so you just get a bunch of particles. And we talk about B tagging, where we try to identify that there was at least one B um, in, in the jet. And we can do this predominantly because of this uh, displaced vertex. So uh, B tagging involves a combination of different things. One, um, you look for a large impact parameter. Uh, so what does that mean? The impact parameter, so you only measure the charged particle tracks, so, and they all go off in funny directions. So you can't always tell exactly how far the vertex was from the B decay from the primary vertex. In particular, you don't know the longitudinal momentum. Uh, so if, if we have the, the B is produced here, this is called the primary vertex, or primary interaction. So the beam comes in here and produces a B, um, and then if the B is neutral, you won't see a track itself, but then you'll see some decay. And so what you see is a bunch of tracks that go off like this. Um, uh, and you can track those, you can figure out from each track, you draw a line and you point the path of closest descent, and that's called the impact parameter. Um, so for each track, you figure out what the, the closest it gets to the um, vertex, and so you look for, um, you count the tracks that have large D. Right? So you can't always reconstruct this vertex, but you can see if you have a track, whether it aligns to the primary vertex or not. Because right? remember, these tracks, they're, they're not, you don't see like a continuous thing. You see a bunch of hits. Right? And so you might see something like that, and then you try to reconstruct a line. So you don't always get everything. Um, so what you try to do is take each track individually and look for tracks that have large impact parameter as, a, as an indication that there might be a, a B associated with it. Um, if you can, you can try to reconduce the secondary vertex. If you have enough tracks that converge to a point, that's, that's even better. So that's um, right, secondary vertex reconstruction. Um, then you look for um, a high multiplicity. Right, and again, this is coming from the typical B is decay to a large number of particles. You might have four or five particles, so you just try to count that there's a large number of particles um, in the jet, and that's an indication that it might be a B. Um, you can look for a mass at the secondary vertex. to be around uh, 4.5 GV, say 5 GV. Right. So you can say, if I can reconstruct this vertex, I can take the invariant mass of all the particles that go there and see if they're somewhere close to the B mass. Um, and that, that can be useful as well. Um, uh, and so basically, the way, the way modern B tagging works is you kind of take all these things and you throw them into a neural network and you get the output. Um, and uh, uh, typical results are around 70% uh, Bs and uh, 1 over 50 uh, background rejection. These are kind of typical numbers. You can vary the point on the rock curve that you're using this. But the point is, if you do B tagging, you should expect that you'll lose around 30% of your Bs, and you'll keep 2% of your background. Right? So there's some contamination. And if you have a very large background, this won't help. But if you have multiple B tags, um, this can be very useful. Um, I think I had an impact parameter slide. Um, this is a slide for pileup. I mentioned pileup before. I just kind of wanted to show you a, a picture from a collision of what pileup is. Remember, pileup is we have 100 collisions per bunch crossing. Um, and so these collisions, some of them you can reconstruct as separate points, which are these different yellow dots from the tracks. The neutral particles you can't localize to a, to a point. Um, the red is a muon, and the blue is an electron. Yeah, here. So this is an example of LHCb secondary vertex con reconstruction. Uh, so here we have, uh, so there's the primary vertex where the beam collides. So you have a lot of tracks converging here. They're not showing you them all. Um, oh, there's also, you also look for muons. That's another, typically B decays, around 30% of B decays um, will have muons, and that's, they, they, they won't be very hard muons, um, but also using muon as a tag. 
Uh, so what happened here is you had a B decay, it decayed to a D, which is a charm meson, and went over here. Well, I guess this is the, so the B came in here, and the B decayed to a charm, and then the charm decayed over here. So you have a, a tertiary vertex, TV, a secondary vertex, SV, um, and the primary vertex is this uh, pink thing. And so these are the bunch of tracks, and you look at track, and you calculate an impact parameter, the distance between this track and the primary vertex. Um, so in this case, they're able to reconstruct things pretty well. Um, LHTB is an experiment designed for B physics, so it collides the same kind of stuff that are collided at Atlas and CMS, but it generally runs at much lower luminosity, so they try to not have such a tight beam spot so they don't have a lot of pileup, um, which really helps with identification. It's also only half a detector, so everything tends to be boosted, and they, they, they don't need to reconstruct everything. They just need to reconstruct um, half the things, and that makes it easier, um, and they have very good uh, silica, very good vertexing. Uh, for identifying bees. Uh, okay. uh, questions about bee tagging? How, how do you calibrate what? For bee tagging? Yeah, so you calibrate it on events that you know have bees, right? So if you had a top, for example, you know there was a bee from the top. Or bees are often producing BB bar pairs, so you'd have a clean tag. This is basically the tag and probe method, where you have one that you really trust, that is a very clean signal, where you might have something like this, where you reconstruct everything, and then you ask on the other side, how well am I reconstructing it, knowing that it has a bee? Um, so almost all these methods are done entirely data-driven, right? So they need simulations to know how their detector works. Um, but they kind of simulate the separate components and identify it. But they do everything they can to, 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 to test this. Um, but, uh, yeah. I mean, again, these simulations, the, you know, the decays are pretty easy to simulate because they're on-shell particles decaying, so you just need to know the branching ratios and the lifetimes, and then you can just, I mean, you, you can write a five-line code to do it. Right? It's, not, it's not like a part-ton shower where there's all these QCD effects. Right? You don't need to calculate nuclear matrix elements. You just need to know branching ratios. So you just have these Bs, and they move along, and they decay and you can, you can figure out how that works. So the simulations are pretty, pretty accurate anyway. All right, bottom, done. We did four particles. Uh, charm, uh, okay, so charm, charm is like bottom, but it's lighter, and so you get all the same stuff, but less of it. Um, you basically, uh, they, they, so this is a charm, the, the, the charm engines are called D for, I guess, historical reasons. Um, I'm not sure why they're called D. Where's Yuval? Maybe he knows. Is he here? All right, ask him. Uh, anyway, so the capital D is a charm, and a lowercase d is a D quark. Charm, five. Uh, so the mass of the charm, MS bar mass, is 1.29 GeV. Uh, these are these D mesons. So we talk about uh, D plus, which is a C D bar bound state, D zero, which is C U bar. D sub S is the strange one. Uh, and these all have around one to two GeV of mass. Uh, there's D star, which are vector mesons, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, the uh, C tau is around 300 microns. Uh, so it's about half of C tau for B. So that means the lifetime for tau is, so you can't see it in that picture because it looks longer. Uh, but typically, D mesons are about they last half as long, so you need twice as good silicon to be able to identify them. Um, so they're just, it's, char charm tagging is very hard because you, you, you typically won't be able to resolve the DDK. Um, also, you have fewer tracks, so basically you start here instead of here, so you get fewer charged particles um, than you would with B. You get fewer muons, you get fewer of everything. Um, so charm tagging is very difficult, but with the advent of these machine learning techniques, actually charm tagging is improving in efficiency. And it's becoming something that's becoming more and more standard. Um, it still doesn't work nearly as well as B, B tagging, um, but it's something they're thinking about for upgrades, improving the detector performance and improving the uh, doing um, uh, charm identification. Uh, so, but otherwise, it's sort of qualitatively similar to B's. 
Uh, all right, uh, move on. The next one is strange. Well, I was going to talk. Strange physics is interesting because you can't strange are the kaons. And the kaon sector is interesting because you can study CP violation, parity violation, um, which were very interesting historically. Um, I think I'm not going to get into any of that uh, or historical, but six. Strange is MS 93 MEV. Um, we have the k -ons. F u bar not is s t bar. Uh, uh, bar. And these are all around uh, 493 mv. Uh, there's also k naught bar, which is t s bar. Uh, um, so these states are degenerate. Uh, they're not mass eigenstates, and they're not CP eigenstates. Uh, the, the, what we generally write is there's the physical particles are called K short, uh, which is K1 plus epsilon K2. Epsilon K1 where k1 is k0 plus k0 bar over the square root of 2, k0 minus k0 bar over the square root of 2. And this thing decays to uh, 3 pions, and this thing decays to 2 pions. So epsilon is some small number um, around 10 to the minus 3. So to a leading approximation at a collider, you can ignore this, and you think of the physical particles as the k short and k long. The k short decays to two pions, and the k long decays to three pions. They're called short and long because the lifetime is uh, um, 0 0.09 nanoseconds and uh, 52 nanoseconds. Um, So uh, that means this guy goes around uh, one meter, and this guy goes around uh, one centimeter. Um, so both of these, the k-long and k-short, show up as particles that are sort of essentially stable in the point of view detector. That is, we see them before they decay. Um, this, this epsilon business has to do with CP violation. I don't really want to get into it. You can read about it in the, in the notes um, or in a book. Um, but the bottom line is there's two kinds of kaons that are commonly produced, uh, and they show up. You can identify them as kaons before they decay. Um, they often deposit a lot of their energy in the calorimetry before they decay. Sometimes you don't, you don't see them decay at all. Um, but if they decay, then you just see pions. Uh, OK, and then the, finally, we can talk about up and down. So these guys are producing pions. So you have UD bar, uh, DU bar, UU bar, uh, and DD bar. Uh, this goes to pi plus, pi minus, um, pi zero, and eta. But let's not worry about um, uh, eta for now. Um, they also form baryons, so the proton. So you have proton, neutron, pi plus and minus. Um, our bound state. So the proton is uh, UUD, and then we have DDU, and so on, and antiprotons. Uh, so the bottom line is uh, the particles that you actually show up at the detector that are considered stable, meaning we see them before they decay, are are the proton, the neutron, the pi plus, the pi minus, uh, the photon, the electron, 
the muon, the k long, the k short, k plus and minus, and then a few other more exotic things, delta and neutrinos. Um, so basically, these are the set of particles that the LHC measures. Everything decays to these things. So we can reconstruct intermediate things like bees, but we're constructing it by actually seeing things um, from this list. Uh, um, so you can ask, how much of these things do we get? So I think I have, let me see. Oh, here's a different projection of that in a display. Yeah, OK. Here's um, output from Pythia. How many of you ever run Pythia or another simulation? OK, not many of you. Um, so uh, there's a number of programs that you can just download and run. Pythia is the easiest one. You can download and run it in a half hour. There's other ones like Herwig that you can download and run in about six months. Um, and there's MadGraph, which you can also run. You can run it online. Um, uh, I'm not sure if Pythia, Pythia probably you can't unrun. But anyway, you run these things, it generates an event, and you see what it looks like. And it generates these things called LHE files. And if you look at them, they have a set of events. So here's, a, here's an event. So it's this event. Um, and there's a lot of numbers. These are the mo uh, momenta and the mass of the particle. So the zeros are mass zero. Uh, um, I think this is the decay width. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, and these are the mothers. So ignore the column. The main things you need to look at are the particle ID, which is this first row, which tells you what you actually saw. So, so these numbers correspond to something you can look up in a table. So 21 is the gluon. So these guys are unstable. Um, and then you get down to stable particles, which are these with the zeros here. Uh, the zero has to do with the color connections. Uh, so 111 is a pi naught. And 211 is, where's 211? Is a pi plus. So you get a lot of 111s and 211s. And then here I get a 2,112, where I looked it up. It's a neutron. Uh, you get a proton. But, but you can see from this that mostly you're getting pions. And in fact, the typical event is almost all pions. So I think from this event, um, we have uh, neutrons. Particle and number. Give you a sense, so we would have uh, neutron, there were 25 neutrons, proton, 11 protons, k plus minus 18, uh, pi 0, 124, and pi plus minus 387. Right? So this is, this is not atypical, this is actually a typical event that almost all of them are pions, and you get a smattering of other particles. The pi naughts we write here as particles, but they're really very unstable, and they decay to photons. Um, and that's the dominant source of photons in the detector, because a pi naught decays 100% of the time to, to, to gamma gamma. Um, but the essential point of this is that the LHC sees pions, right? Sometimes you get more exotic things, but essentially the thing that it measures are pions. Um, uh, the, uh, Andrea talked about pion as being this Yukawa's meson that he predicted in 1932 uh, and was discovered two years later. This, this um, was actually the muon. Uh, and, you know, it, it would have made his career to see the pion, right? I mean, it was his dream particle, and it was very hard to make. It took another 10 years um, to, to make them in the lab, and now we just make them constantly, and they're sort of distractions from other things we want. Um, so sort of yesterday's signals are today's backgrounds, uh, but the pions more so than anything else. Um, so we know a lot about pions because we've been southering them for a long time, and they have a lot of interesting properties. Oh. Um, what else do I have? Higgs, okay. Um, so I have leptons and Higgses, and we have 10 minutes. Um, Okay, let me, let me talk about leptons. Um, I want to talk about tauons because there were a number of questions about it. Uh, and it's very collider y. So, um, there's not much to say about electrons and muons. Electrons. Well, the main thing is that they radiate a lot. Because they're light, when you're bending them around the magnetic fields, they have synchrotron radiation and bremsstrahlung, um, and they basically deposit all energy.
Um, uh, okay, muons. Muons are heavy. Uh, muon is 200 times heavier than the electron, and so it radiates a lot less. Uh, it does not radiate much. Uh, weakly interacting. And you measure its energy. From momentum. So a muon typically leaves the detector before it deposits all its energy. An, energy, an electron will deposit its energy in the E column and stop. Um, uh, the muon will not deposit all its energy. You get a few hits and you try to bend it with the magnetic field. You measure momentum from the curvature of the track, and from that you deduce its energy, knowing that it's a, mu uh, a muon. And that's why these detectors are so big, because you need strong fields and a long way to bend them so you can start seeing them bend. Um, Now let's talk about tauons. So I mentioned tauons before. Tauons are funny things because they're leptons, but they look like hadrons. Um, and that's because unlike the muon and the electron, the tauon is heavier than the pion. So it can decay to pion, um, and it does. Tauon. Tau has, uh, m tau is 1.7. B, uh, so it decays, so the tau will decay to a neutrino, and um, a, a muon or electron and the neutrino around 30% of the time, and the rest of it will decay through a W to a U and a D bar. Uh, uh, I should say it's more, well, like 35. Uh, and, and again, there's, so it's basically, uh, we, we can do the same sort of counting, right? There's three colors of up and down that, it, that can decay to here, so we get three, four, five, so we get roughly 20% to each of the decay modes, so we get, uh, and there's, there's um, some small corrections because the masses aren't negligible here, so we can't just treat them as the same, but roughly speaking, you get 20% muons, 20% electrons, and 60% hadrons. Uh, you know, corrected to 35, 65. Uh, so a tau will decay to pi plus and a neutrino 10% of the time. Um, that's like I've drawn here. Uh, but also it can decay to uh, a rho plus, so rho meson, uh, which is a vector excitation of the uh, of the pion, and then the rho is unstable to decay to say pi zero, pi plus neutrino, and then the pi zero decays to gamma gamma. Uh, so we get gamma gamma pi plus neutrino. Uh, so we get, uh, so things like this are, we call these one prong decays, and that's around, uh, 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 51% of the time. Alternatively, you can have tau decay to the A meson, uh, so tau plus goes to A plus nu, and the A will go to pi plus, pi minus, uh, pi plus nu, and this is 14%, and this is called a three-prong decay. So it's the prong, what does a prong mean? They're just number of charged particles. So you see these taus the same way you would see Bs, you see a bunch of tracks, right? So taus are like their leptons. So you say you had a W that decayed leptonic to the taus. You'd see just three particles. It was a three-point decay or just one particle. Um, if it was just one particle, there'd be completely maybe, maybe two photons, and you could see the photons separately, and the neutrinos you don't see. So you either have one charged particle or three charged particles, and those are ways to identify photons, uh, taus. So you either have uh, leptons or you have uh, one-prong decays or three-prong decays. And I can draw my pie chart here. So we get 51% uh, one prong, 
uh, 14 14 percent three prong and 35 percent leptons uh, so what do you look for tau tagging? You look for low multiplicity, one track, two tracks, three, one track, three tracks. Um, you look for these kind of narrow jets with low multiplicity particles. And the other thing you look for tau is isolation. That because they're leptonic, they produce from things like W decays, which is also a leptonic decay. So uh, unlike Bs, which are produced from hydronic activity, from a gluon splitting to BB bar pair, you're not going to have a gluon splitting to taus. So if you have like a gluon jet, it's not going to have taus in it, but it'll have Bs and I'll have light quark jets. So tiles you often see isolated. Um, one of the main uses of this isolation criteria is in Higgs production. Because um, if you look for something like Higgs to tau tau, which Higgs has a reasonable branching ratio to tau, uh, he would look for tau's without any hadronic activity around it. Because the Higgs is, is uh, uncolored, and so is the tau. So you look for these isolated particles as one way to, to, to find tau's and part of useful in tau tagging. Um, but anyway, because they decay to pions, they're considered hadronic objects. It's certainly not like a muon where you just get a clean track and you measure its form momentum completely. You always get neutrinos from tau decays because they always decay weakly. And so you always have some missing energy and you can't, reconstru you can't reconstruct them completely. So when we say leptonic, we always mean muons or electrons because those are the clean leptons. And the tauon is kind of a, its own object that you have to do separate tau tagging for. Um, it's kind of messy, but actually tau tagging now has gotten to be very efficient. Um, so tau physics is a growing area of interest with lots of applications, um, in particular to Higgs physics. Um, okay, so we didn't have time to do the, the Higgs, but it would take another 20 minutes, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, um, but we did cover the rest of the particles. We covered all the particles up to 2012, um, which I think is pretty good. So I'll stop here. We can take questions. <laughs>